Hi folks, thanks for joining us today for our Safety and Health Magazine webcast sponsored by JJ Keller. We're gonna give our audience members just a minute to get settled in and we'll start the presentation shortly. Thanks again, folks, for joining us today for the Safety and Health webcast sponsored by JJ Keller. We're gonna give folks just a little bit longer to settle in and we'll start the presentation shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Forklift Safety and Compliance, Your Toughest Questions Answered, sponsored by JJ Keller. My name is Barry Botino and I'm an Associate Editor at Safety and Health. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to share. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speakers and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speakers from JJ Keller. If you have a question, just click on that Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the send button. We welcome those questions at any time during today's event. After this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little later. Finally, this webcast will be archived. If you want to view this presentation or any of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our speakers. With us today are Mark Stromey and Cindy Pauley. Mark is a senior editor on the EHS content team at JJ Keller. He specializes in OSHA general industry and construction safety topics, including the theme of today's webinar, forklift compliance. His expertise also includes electrical safety, fall protection, walking working surfaces, workplace violence, and aerial and scissor lifts. Cindy's role as an editor on JJ Keller's EHS content team allows her to put her 13 years of experience in safety program development and management in oil and gas, chemical, manufacturing, construction, and agriculture to work every day. She is a certified occupational safety specialist and also a certified occupational hearing conservationist. Again, we thank you all for tuning in to today's presentation. And Mark, whenever you're ready, take it away. Very good. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the webcast is presented by the JJ Keller Safety Management Suite. Finally, a solution that works as hard as you do. The Safety Management Suite streamlines compliance at every level of your business, making it easy to develop, implement, and maintain an industry-specific safety program. And because your success is a priority, today's attendees will be offered complimentary access to our compliance tools and resources in the safety management suite. And again, on behalf of our sponsor, thank you for joining us. All right, this uh, webcast is gonna cover quite a bit. Uh, we're gonna start with the scope of the standard, OSHA's powered industrial truck standard. We're gonna move into training next, uh, since that area is where we get quite a few questions from customers and clients. Inspections uh, are another area that generate questions. And then we're gonna cover all these other uh, points on the slide. Uh, Cindy, how about if you go ahead and start us out with the scope, please? I sure will. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Barry. Um, also wanted to thank everybody for being here today. We know that your time is valuable and we're really grateful that you chose to spend today with us. So it just seems logical to start out with the scope. As any of you that have delved into the regulations, you'll know they always start with the scope. So we're going to do that here today. And the scope of OSHA's 1910-178 standard, which is your powered industrial truck or pit, you might hear us saying throughout the presentation, um, 
basically it answers the question of what equipment exactly is covered. Like our pallet jacks covered or scissor lifts covered or golf carts, things like that. So as you see here are some specific examples of equipment that is covered under the pit standard. And this comes from the preamble to the 1910-178 final rule. And it's based on the ANSI standard, which again, OSHA adopted. And the major exception from the standard, usually there are exceptions in the standard. So the major exception to this one involves earth moving equipment. And this would be things like front end loaders or backhoes. These do not fall under 1910-178 and they're specifically exempted in this particular scope. Now, even if this equipment has been modified to accept forks and you may think it becomes a forklift, um, equipment that was designated to move earth is not covered under this standard. It's covered under a completely separate standard. Likewise, we've been told by OSHA that golf carts are not covered under the standard. And there are letters of interpretation, or you might hear those called LOIs, that state that scissor lifts are not covered as well. These are generally people movers and not material movers. Okay, so you have three different things there, earth mover, people mover, material mover. Okay, so that's how you differentiate. Now, similarly, equipment like hand carts that are not powered are also not covered. So there has to be power to them as well. So now, depending on the equipment in the industry, the equipment may or may not be covered under some separate specific standard. For example, the construction industry standard on material handing, handling equipment is a good example of that. Otherwise, the general duty clause would apply. And where OSHA often references industry standards and the manufacturer's operating instructions as well. Now that we've had the scope taken care of, Mark, let's talk a little bit about training. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to spend you know, time on the training requirements, as obviously those must be met. But we're going to branch out a bit and try to shed some light on a few issues that either the OSHA requirements don't address or uh, they don't address in any great detail. So moving on here, this is the, you know, we, we're talking about trainers, all right? Uh, we get so many questions on this. Uh, and really, it comes down to, you know, uh, your trainer, how effective are they? Well, the way I like to think about it, you can go about this in a couple different ways. Certainly, your trainers need to know the OSHA regulations. Also, they need to have experience operating the equipment, be committed to training success, and be good you know, com communicators. That's just as important as them knowing the regulations. So think about it this way. Uh, you have someone that's really a good, safe forklift operator. Uh, but do they want to train others? Are they committed to the training? And importantly, do they have the communication skills to transfer their knowledge to the trainees? You know, some operators do and some don't. So keep that in mind. Also, I like to suggest to keep some criteria of your own for when an operator can become a trainer. Um, it shouldn't just be because they've operated the equipment for X number of years without an incident. You know what you want to do is observe these operators uh, and make sure they're safety minded. Okay, you don't you don't want a trainer is passing along shortcuts to new employees. Another great question that we get is uh, who can conduct the training? So let's start with that. And OSHA specifically addresses this. Uh, they say all operator training and evaluation must be conducted by persons who have the knowledge training and experience to train operators and evaluate their competence. The standard doesn't go into any more detail. It's really up to you, the employer, to make sure trainers meet these general qualifications. But also keep in mind, and we get this question too, OSHA has no requirements for trainers to take a certain class or classes. They don't have to hold any sort of certifications or be recertified as trainers at specific intervals. The only real aspect of this that OSHA has clarified is the trainer does in fact need to have experience operating the equipment and attachments that the trainees are gonna use. However, the standard doesn't require that the trainers operate a pit regularly that is outside of their operator training duties as part of their job function or responsibility. So really what that says is they need to know how to run the equipment and all the attachments, but they don't have to, that's not part of their job duties. Moving on, 
uh, third party trainers. You know, this is really common where companies will send, you know, uh, the trainees out to a third party to do the training. Nothing wrong with this at all. Uh, you know, one thing though to keep in mind, check the credentials of this third party training because let's say you run a distribution facility with warehouses and a loading dock. Make sure that the third party trainers know the ins and outs of operating in that type of environment rather than just simply a, let's say a manufacturing facility. So that, that's important that they can associate their training with your facility. But really the way I look at it is it's best if you bring in these third party trainers to do the training at your facility. And why would we want that? Well, uh, they can train on your equipment, right? They're gonna train on your forklifts and they're going to be in your facility, so they will be training on your unique operations. And that's, of course, where the trainees are going to be operating anyway, ultimately. So keep in mind, if you send your trainers out to a class, trainees out to a class or offsite training center, you still have to do the evaluation. They're doing the training. They're doing, you know, the, the pr probably the uh you know, the basic training in the classroom and then the practical, but you need to evaluate them in your workplace. And of course, then you do need to supplement the training with the truck and the workplace specific training requirements. All right, moving on, regardless of who you choose to do the training, OSHA has a specific list of requirements that must be met. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, those requirements briefly. We're going to incorporate some of the more common questions we get from clients about those requirements. All right, first of all, and this kind of goes without saying, but OSHA requires all operators must be trained before they're being allowed to operate the forklifts. Um, and the same thing goes for pallet trucks, order pickers, stand-up units, pretty much any powered type of material handling equipment requires a training. So, Think about this, what does that training consist of? Uh, well, you can see the three bullets on the slide there. And OSHA is very, very specific about this. This is one of the better regulations, I think, um, where they specified the training requirements. So all operators must receive a combination of training. Uh, training must consist of things like formal training. Uh, that's a lecture, classroom typically. Uh, you're going to have discussions or you're maybe going to show a video or do some computer interactive learning. You're going to hand out some written material, possibly that type of thing. Next, they must receive practical training. And what does that mean? That's demonstrations performed by the trainer. And then the trainee does practical exercises. Okay, so demonstration and then actual performance uh, uh, by the trainee. And then of course, that third component is the operators must receive an actual performance evaluation. And what does that mean exactly? Well, OSHA says you have to operate the, you know, the trainees have to operate the equipment and you have to observe and evaluate them before they're considered trained per the standard. And again, like I said, this is one of those cases where I think the OSHA standard makes a lot of sense. And even if it didn't require this three tier combination approach, I think most people would figure that out that that's the way to do it. And usually uh, before I turn it over to Cindy, you'll introduce the concepts uh, of forklift operation during that classroom portion of the training. Uh, in particular, the more informational aspects such as the OSHA requirements, which are part of the training. You do have to go through the OSHA 1910.178 standard. You don't have to read it, but you have to cover it. Uh, then you're going to do that practical part of the training to familiarize trainees with the controls, uh, talk about load handling and that type of thing. And then one thing I like to think about is with that practical training, it's usually best to ramp up the training, start with simple skills, like just having them uh, run the forklift around in an area that's away from everybody else, and then build on those skills. It kind of builds up the confidence of the trainee. And with that, I will turn it over to Cindy. 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. I did think of something when you were talking about third party training too. another benefit of that is, uh, as you guys know, from being in your own types of training, it's nice just to have a different face to come in, you know, people like to hear from different professionals. So that's another perk to that third party training. So moving on to my portion now the training program content. Now, aside from requirements for how to do the training, OSHA does give detailed list of topics to cover during the training. Okay, so there are some things that you must cover. And these are usually separated in two different categories, one being truck related, and the other being workplace related. And remember that OSHA doesn't or does require you to include information on OSHA's forklift standard, like Mark just mentioned, and that's got to be an um, integral part of your training program. They need to know what the rules are behind what they're doing. This requirement can be easy to overlook, but it is a good way to approach it um, is in the classroom portion of the training, depending on your workforce and how they learn best. Now, as we go over the truck and workplace related topics, keep in mind that if a topic does not apply to your trucks or it doesn't apply to your workplace, you do not have to train on it, okay? We get a lot of people that are worried that they have to cover everything, but if it doesn't apply to your situ situation, it, you don't have to train on that. A good example of this is like, if you don't have any ramps or maybe you don't have hazardous um, classified locations or railroad tracks to go over, uh, your forklift operators don't need that training. Okay, now the way the standard is written, however, you'll want to have something to back up the decision to skip a particular topic. So this could be as simple as um, writing down that you, a written statement, for example, that we've surveyed the, the hazards in the workplace, we found that there are no ramps or slopes or railroad tracks, then just sign it, date it, and tuck it away in case somebody asks for it later. Simple as that. So let's dive a little bit further into the truck related topics. You, and these are gonna be over the course of the next two slides. And we're not gonna go into each one of these in detail, but we did want to at least list them out for you to get you thinking along these lines. And much of the information can be found in every PITS operating manual. And OSHA expects forklift operators to have training on the information in the operator's manual. So just like Mark said about the regulations, you don't have to read it verbatim, but they need to be familiar with the information that's in that manual. For example, providing instruction on the differences between a forklift and an automobile, really good idea because operating a forklift feels completely different than driving a car. For those of us that have done it, we realize it's a way different, okay? And especially new forklift operators, they're gonna be used to driving cars more than anything else. And their initial expectations are gonna be that operating the forklift is just the same. But uh, like I said, it's not. So wanna make sure you cover that with them. Now, here's the rest of the list I was telling you about. These are all, again, truck related topics. And you'll notice that you have to train on capacity and stability including the stability triangle. You'll also notice that you must train on the operator's manual, like I mentioned, and sometimes we get questions on employee access to the manual. OSHA does not require the manual to be kept on the truck, okay, and the standard doesn't specifically require you to, to provide employee access to the manual, but it does make a lot of sense to have the manual available to your operators, okay, allow them that information, the freedom to look things up if they need to, it just encourages them to be safe to operators. And if you do any in-house truck maintenance or repairs, your mechanic should be able to refer to the manufacturer's manual as well. So you'll want to make that available to them as well. Now, a lot of these truck-related topics lend themselves to the practical part of training. Remember, Mark talked about classroom practical evaluation. So that second leg here, a lot of the truck-related topics are going to be co covered there. And it's easier to demonstrate how the controls work than it is to try to describe them in a lecture, right? So a lot of hands-on there is helpful to operators but you still wanna introduce these topics, probably introduce them in the classroom portion where it's easier for them to have a question and answer session before they have to go out and try to figure out how to operate things. Now we're gonna shift a little bit to the workplace specific topics. This information is what's going to be unique to your facility. So it won't be covered in training videos or other training products unless your company has put those together specifically for you. But if you do have access to those, training videos and other materials are very valuable additions to your training program. And employees will learn a lot from them. But as you use training materials, you need to add in the workplace specific information your operators must have in order to navigate safely in your workplace. Okay, so add those specifics in there. The trainees have to successfully complete the formal and practical instruction, but how do you determine success is really going to be up to you, okay? So for the classroom portion, you could give a written exam, you could give an oral test to everybody, or otherwise evaluate their knowledge. Um, you could, I've seen people even play games, you know, to just to assess whether or not people have understood the information. 
but for the practical training, the training must be able to safely perform all operations used on the job. Mark kind of talked on that a little bit. They need to know how to operate safely. And so far, everything we've said about training applies to initial training for new operators. This slide leads us a little bit into the discussion on refresher training and the avoidance of duplicative training, okay? So sometimes you don't wanna duplicate efforts if you don't have to, right? We get questions about training for newly hired forklift operators who already have experience. And as we'll discuss shortly, OSHA does allow for you to accept previous experience and training, but generally experienced new hires will always need training on these workplace related topics like I just went over here. Now, and Mark, I think it's gonna go over a little bit more in detail for us on the refresher training. Absolutely. And one other thing we're getting some really good questions. So if you have a question, please send it in right away so we can get a chance to look at some of these. Uh, don't wait till the end. All right, so let's move on, talk about refresher training. Now, a lot of people, it, this is kind of a confusing topic. Um, they wanna know, is refresher training required annually? It is not. So instead, OSHA requires refresher training to be conducted whenever any of those situations, those bullets we have listed there, come up. Okay, so the first one, an operator's been observed to operate the vehicle in an unsafe manner. Makes sense. They need retraining, refresher training. Uh, there's an accident or a near miss incident. Safety issues are uncovered during a performance evaluation, refresher training. Uh, operator is assigned to drive a different type of truck. So let's say that they run a sit down rider, but you want them to do now a stand up truck or an order picker, they need refresher training. Uh, in that case, it might be pretty extensive since those two are, or three are pretty different. And then the last one there, uh, refresher training must take place if a condition in the workplace changes in a manner that could affect the safe operation of the truck. Maybe you build an addition, you know, and there's some changes there. So uh, that's another, uh, that's the last one. Now, so you only have to conduct refresher training when one of those situations occur. There isn't a set schedule. All right, having the right training program in place is essential if OSHA knocks on your door. It can be time consuming creating and customizing your safety training program and policies and procedures. And since JJ Keller Safety Management Suite is sponsoring today's event, we'd like to offer everyone access to our customizable training resources and templates that will easily help you produce the materials you need. So you're gonna see a poll pop up. Please uh, use that to select your interests. And then, of course, we're going to send you uh, our white paper, OSHA's top 10 violations. This uh, white paper takes a close look at the top 10 most frequently cited standards. All right, moving on here. We're going to cover duplicate training. So OSHA does give you a break when an operator has received training in the past. You don't have to duplicate training that they had before. Um, this applies to new hires as well as to refresher training. But as Cindy said, for new hires, you're always going to have workplace specific issues and possibly truck specific issues you're gonna have to train on. Now, one other thing here. So you have a... Uh, somebody come from another company to your company and you are going to uh, test them, right? They say that they can run a sit down um, and it's your responsibility uh, to evaluate them to determine if they in fact can. So just because they have a card or something that says, you know, they were trained in this, uh, it's still your responsibility uh, to do that. Now, um, let's Here's an example too that I wanna cover. So you have a, an employee running a lift, uh, they turn sharply when they're driving and the load falls from the fork. You know, this is gonna call for refresher training. Uh, of course, even though the operator had previous training on steering stability, load handling and speed, uh, a review of those topics is needed. But again, here, like we're talking about duplicate training, OSHA, does not expect you to cover something unrelated like battery charging in this 
refresher training. It's only focused on the corrective actions that are needed uh, to get them back up to speed. Uh, in addition, you know, like I said, the, regardless of the driver's training background, you have to evaluate each uh, operator before you let them drive in your facility. Moving on to a completely different subject from refresher training, we're going to talk about the evaluation of your operator's performance. Um, and this, again, has to be done at the time of initial training. And why are we doing this evaluation? Well, uh, we want to make sure that the training that we've given, including refresher training, has been effective. And then on top of that, you have to do this evaluation at least every three years. Some companies do it more often, but the reg says every three years. So what does that mean exactly? Um, well, every three years, every single one of your operators has to be observed while they're running the lift in your workplace, and it has to be done under actual workplace conditions. So during the evaluation, you're gonna be watching the operator, um, and then you're going to also question them to demonstrate that they have the knowledge to run that lift in your facility. And a key point uh, I wanna mention here, this evaluation has to be more than just a written or verbal test. Literally, the employer must observe the uh, operator in action, performing all their different tasks related to running that lift. So this may take more than a couple hours, depending on what they do, if they're doing one type of task one day, and then they work, let's say, in a different part of the warehouse at the next, you need to go in that area and observe them. And again, getting back to where we started, the evaluation must be conducted by someone who has the knowledge, training, and experience to evaluate the truck operator's competence. All right, now we get this question quite a bit um, and it's does OSHA require you to give your operators a wallet card or a license? OSHA does not um, require that. But, um, you know, many employers do, you know, give them something. And why do they do that? Well, first of all, if you're a supervisor and um, you're, you're checking to see if a uh, operator that operates a sit down can do a order picker, but you're not sure you would have to then go back. You could ask them, but you would still want to verify it. So you would have to go back to the training file and look. But if you give them a wallet card or some a license, it, that'll list exactly what they can operate. So if they can operate three different types of lifts, you would of course put that on the card, right? Um, and also the way I like to think about it is, you know, when somebody gives you something like that, like a card that says you completed training, that kind of reinforces how critical forklift operation is, you know, like the mindset is you can't operate it without a license. So that's the interesting thing. So OSHA does not require it, but it's not a bad idea for you to issue that. Uh, the going on OSHA only requires the employer certify the training has been done. What is that? What does that mean? It means placing a record on file that the training and evaluation was completed. So you're gonna also include things like the operator's name, the date of the training or trainings, cause it might be over a period of days, uh, the date that the evaluation was done, and then the names of anybody who was involved in the training and an evaluation, because you may have more than one person, maybe one person does a classroom and somebody else does the other two parts, whatever. Uh, but there's no uh, requirement to give that operator any documentation, uh, at least not from federal OSHA. But if you have operations in the state of Michigan, they do require a wallet card. That's the only state plan we're aware of that has that requirement. And if you want to look it up, uh, it's covered under Michigan's Reg R 408.12154. And the interesting thing, it does not apply to motorized hand trucks. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, a lot of good information there. So let's chat a little bit about maintenance. Maintenance questions often come up for us. 
And you'll always want to take pits that aren't operating safely out of service immediately, okay? If repairs need to be done, you want to make sure that authorized personnel perform those repairs. You can't just have any operator do them or, or somebody else that's not authorized to do those sorts of repairs unless they, like I said, they're authorized by the employer or some other agency approved by the employer. And don't forget too that no repairs, maintenance repairs can be made in class one, two or three locations. Okay, you'll wanna be careful of fire hazards when working on the fuel and ignition systems. And keep in mind that electric forklifts have their own set of hazards. And using replacement parts from the manufacturer should always be done since they usually have the proper parts. You won't wanna try fitting round pegs into square hole types of things. And don't alter the pit by adding extra parts that aren't approved unless you get explicit permission from the manufacturer. This also includes adding additional counterweights, okay? So let's talk a little bit from maintenance. Let's jump into inspections to see if the maintenance needs to be done. In this section, uh, we're gonna cover the few questions that you see on the slides here. We wanna go over what the OSHA requirements are, what does an inspection consist of, when do you know if it issues um, taking the equipment out of service, and the one that we get off asked quite often is do inspections have to be documented? It's probably one of the most popular questions that we get. So with that, OSHA requirements for inspecting forklifts are in paragraph Q7 of the standard, and OSHA requires that the equipment be inspected daily prior to use or after shift, after each shift if it's used around the clock. Now that after each shift, um, it's kind of confusing to some people, but I'll just give you an idea of how this has been done in my experiences. Say you have two shifts, you'll have somebody come in that's, you know, you have a, an eight to five or eight to four thirty shift and then an afternoon shift you just have somebody that's coming in on that shift um, inspect the equipment before they come in if you have three shifts just at the beginning of each of those three shifts have somebody check that and you will fulfill that requirement for OSHA so a lot of people do that at shift change um, now obviously this is somewhat vague of a requirement which is why we get so many questions for more information so in terms of how to inspect, obviously first check the manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, we keep going back to the manual and the manufacturer's recommendations, always the best place to start. They know the most about each vehicle. And because also because each truck will have specific features and they have unique inspection needs as well. But inspections will consist typically, you can pretty much bank on this, consistently of two parts. Okay, first the operator should conduct a pre-start visual check. And this is going to be with the key turned off. And then the operator should perform an operational check with the engine running. We'll go over those a little bit more. So on the screen here, you can see some general items common to most forklifts. Again, these don't come from an OSHA standard, but they are based on recommendations in OSHA's forklift e-tool. And you can see find that e-tool on their website. You'll wanna check the fluid levels, leaks, cracks, defects, pretty much all the parts of the forklift it can be checked with the engine off. And especially giving close attention to those that can really jeopardize safety, like the tires or the fork condition, um, anything like that that's extremely important to safety. Also note that these are general items found for most all forklifts. There will be additional items, as I mentioned a moment ago, for electric powered forklifts, lifts, but also LP gas fueled forklifts. Okay, keep these in mind as well, because they might even require additional PPE for the inspection. So for example, obviously with the electric forklifts, there's a battery electrolyte exposure. And then of course, with the LP gas exposure on the gas forklifts that can cause freeze burn to the hands. So again, PPE could be required. So just refer to the operator manufacturer's recommendations on those. Now, after you having the operators teaching them how to complete the pre-operational inspection, they should then follow up with an operational inspection. Again, this is with the engine running. And the inspection typically includes the items that you see on the slide here. And again, aside from these items we've been talking about, make sure you check the manufacturer's recommendations as well, because like I said, each truck has unique features and will require unique inspections. And we also get asked quite a bit about documenting the inspections and keeping those records for a specific period of time. OSHA, believe it or not, doesn't actually require that daily forklift inspections be documented or written down. And that means, of course, and there's no specific record retention times, right? Now, obviously, even though it's not a requirement, using an inspection checklist, either written or electronic, is really a good idea. And I say this for two reasons. 
first of all, it ensures that the essential features of the vehicle are inspected routinely. Okay, operators are going to get in the groove and a routine and they're going to start skipping things if they don't have a checklist to follow. So that's always a good um, point of reference for them. Also, secondly, it provides evidence to an OSHA compliance officer that you're actually doing these inspections as you're supposed to. Okay, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to talk a little bit about those attachments and modifications. I see we have some questions about towing. So this is perfect timing for this. Absolutely, thanks, uh, Cindy. And keep these questions coming in. We're, we're getting a lot of really good ones. All right, uh, attachments, modifications. We're gonna ask, answer questions about getting manufacturers approval, uh, what to do if the manufacturer rejects a request for an addition or modification. Uh, we'll talk about personal platforms. That's a topic we get a lot of questions. And on the screen right now, you can see a barrel clamp, kind of their moving paper roll. So that would be considered attachment, uh, probably come directly from the manufacturer. Um, all right. So here's one that trips up a lot of people, and that's OSHA requires prior manufacturer written approval for additions or modifications affecting what they like to call capacity and safe operation. Well, let me tell you, OSHA's interpreted this liberally to cover everything from warning lights to personal platforms. So if you're planning on adding to or modifying your powered industrial trucks, you're going to have to get the manufacturer's prior written approval. And if they do, in fact, give that, then you're going to have to change the capacity plates and operating instructions. And a lot of times they'll send you new capacity plates um, so you don't have to worry about that. But really, what do you do if the manufacturer says no or simply doesn't reply at all? This is not uncommon. Um, and OSHA, of course, in this case, they do address it. And we're talking about um, an OSHA letter of interpretation or LOI way back from April 1997. It's still valid. Uh, and it talks, uh, it says, if an employer seeks written uh, approval from the manufacturer, for modifications or additions and manufacturer says no or doesn't respond, then OSHA will accept a written approval of that mod or addition from a qualified registered professional engineer. So this person has to perform a safety analysis and address any safety and or structural issues contained in the manufacturer's negative response or in the case where they didn't respond, they still have to do that uh, safety analysis uh, prior to granting approval. So you're going to have to hire somebody to do this, and that's not going to be cheap. And then, of course, you're going to make sure those capacity plates are changed accordingly to address that. Moving on to personal platforms, their attachments, they require uh, pre prior written approval before you can add them. Uh, one way to get around this is to buy them from the manufacturer of your forklift because, of course, they'll be happy to sell you one. And they then, of course, it's already approved. But the first thing to consider if you're not going to do that is whether or not the manufacturer even will allow the platform to be used. So you, you bought it from somewhere else. It's mechanically sound. Um, so we're talking about adding a personal platform to equipment like a sit down forklifts forks. We're not talking about equipment designed to lift personnel like an order picker because that came with it. All right. This is something that you determine uh, you're going to add and then you have to get that permission. So once you get that permission uh, from the manufacturer to go ahead and do this, then there's a couple other things you have to think about, you know, safety issues. One of them would be falls, you know, off that platform. So you have to protect your workers with either a guardrail or give them a personal fall arrest system and let them tie off to something. And, a, and of course, another thing, the platform has to be secured or it could easily slip off or tip and we don't want that. Now, OSHA uh, doesn't really get into the details of safe operation when using personal platforms with forklifts, uh, but they have referenced this industry standard that's on the screen, ANSI ITSTEF B56.1. So I encourage you to take a look at this because it's very it's chock full of guidance on fall protection. 
properly securing personal platforms and procedures for ele elevating personnel. And of course, with all these um, standards are copyrighted, but you can go to that website there and you can download it for free. And if you're gonna do that, you wanna look at the elevating personnel information and that's at section 4.17. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Yeah, I like that. ANSI's a wealth of information. They really are. So let's talk a little bit now about forklift operation. Here are a few of the questions on the slide here that we're going to address. In particular, a couple of unorthodox uses of forklifts, as well as the more common questions about speed limits and pedestrian safety, leaving the truck attended and operating on ramps and inclines. And I believe, Tom, you asked us a question about ramps and inclines. So this ought to help answer that question as we move forward here. So let's start with split forking and bulldozing, okay? In other words, um, lifting the fork, the split forking is lifting two pallets using one fork for each, or in the case of bulldozing, pushing a load on the floor with a load on the forks, okay? So OSHA says that these two practices could pose a number of different hazards. And they say that forklifts are also probably not designed to be used to lift and move loads in the split forking or bulldozing manner. Again, that uh, manufacturer's recommendations will say whether or not these are going to be permitted. And OSHA requires that employees receive training on any operating instructions, warnings, or precautions. Remember, listed in that operator's manual. So if the manual has warnings against these practices, then it must be included in the training program content. Uh, and that's, again, according to OSHA, you have to put that in your training. Plus, OSHA requires that loads be stable and safely arranged. It's very likely then that depending on the equipment and conditions, that if you're split forking or bulldozing, that these probably aren't going to be stable loads, okay, and could very well result in tipping or knocking something else over. So um, we, there is a letter of interpretation, you can see there it's for November 2nd of 1999, that gives a little bit more additional information on this practice in case you'd like to look up some more on that. Now, when we're talking about speed limits, OSHA doesn't have specific speed limits set for the safe operation of pits, though they generally address it in 1910-178, N as in Nora, one, so that's paragraph N1, by requiring operators to follow authorized plant speed limits, okay? So they kind of refer back to what the employer determines to be plant speed limits. However, in determining what is the safe speed, OSHA would take a variety of factors into consideration, as you can see on this slide. So they're going to take, they're going to look at the type of truck, the manufacturer's limitations, the stopping distance, pedestrians, all those sorts of things into consideration when they deem that your speed limits are safe or not. So, um, they're going to, OSHA says that they're going to consider the totality of circumstances surrounding that. Okay. So they're going to take in all of those factors. And ANSI, it's def B56.1, which is listed there on your screen as well, now has a very complicated set of formulas. It's in their table three and it's located on page 40. It can help you determine speeds in a facility if you'd like. Um, so we've put that reference on the slide for you as well. Again, that's table three on page 40 if you're interested in looking at that. A lot of uh, manufacturers that I've worked in, we've just established the, the speed limit to be no, no faster than what people can walk. That way, uh, we know that they're not going to overrun any pedestrians that way. So just one idea to throw out there. Now let's talk a little bit of ramps and inclines. This is an area where we get a few questions. Um, so we just want to cover that a little bit because there are I think some manufacturers and different trainers have different um, perspectives on this. So we've pulled in some OSHA ANSI information about this. So we just wanna cover that today with you. Now with a typical sit down forklift, you'll always point the load up the incline when you're carrying a load. Okay, so we're talking about when carrying a load, regardless of the direction you're traveling. So in other words, going up the incline, operators will drive forward with the forks pointed upgrade and use a spotter if the load blocks the operator's view, of course. Now, when going down the incline, the operator will drive in a reverse, turning their head and facing downgrade with the forks pointed upgrade. Again, that's when there's a load. On the other hand, when you're traveling without a load, the forks really should point downgrade regardless of the direction of travel. And this is so operators will drive in reverse, going up the incline and drive forward going down the incline. 
Now that's for the standard forklift. It's a little bit different with a pallet jack. And in those cases, the forks really should be pointed down grade, regardless of the direction of travel and regardless of whether or not there's a load. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. I think we're gonna get ready to wrap things up and go through some Q&A. Absolutely. Um, we covered quite a bit here. I'm not gonna go over this because we're gonna get to these questions, which are really good, but these are you know common questions we've gotten over the years. Uh, and we're going to go ahead. Uh, we're gonna launch another poll here for you. So it's time for your questions. If you haven't sent yours in, now's the time to do so. Uh, Cindy and I wanna thank our event sponsor, JJ Keller Safety Management Suite. So with your complimentary access, you'll be able to look at all our popular safety management tools, including written safety plan templates, customizable training programs. We have audit and inspection checklists, word for word federal regs state regulatory comparisons, and much more. And also we have an expert help feature that you can use and you can then uh, send us questions just like you're doing today and we will definitely answer them. So uh, use that poll, select your interest, we'll send you our white paper, prepare your warehouse for an OSHA safety inspection because that's a big emphasis program now they, they're really cracking down uh, because an OSHA inspection can be scary knowing your warehouse may be selected for inspection makes it more critical to prepare check your compliance get your records in shape plan what to do if OSHA shows up and the guidance in this white paper will definitely help you uh, so let's move on I think Barry's going to start answering some uh, asking some questions for us well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Cindy, for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Before we start the q and I want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. This survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. Your input is really important to us because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. And you're both correct. We have some excellent questions waiting for you. So, Cindy, I'm going to start with you. Barbara asks, who would be responsible for temporary workers where the host employer has day-to-day -day supervision? That's a really, really good question. In fact, we such a good question. We created a separate webcast on that. So I'm glad she asked the question. Um, actually, the this can be contracted, determined in a contract between the host employer and the temporary agency or staffing agency. Um, what typically happens though, and again, you can contract whatever you want with them, put together a written uh, formal contract, but typically what happens is the temporary hiring agency or the staffing agency will cover the basics. So they'll cover over that stuff we talked about, like what the OSHA regulations are, basic what a, what the oper operating controls might look like. They could even cover the stability triangle, that kind of information. And then the host employer would cover the workplace specific stuff, anything additional, recap anything that they want to. So it's really kind of up to an agreement between between the two agencies. So, but ultimately whoever's um, supervising employees directly is the one that's going to have to make sure that they've received the training from either place. Okay. So good question. Great. Great. Uh, Mark, next question for you. Dan would like to know uh, for new operators who have never operated the pit, what's the best practice for giving them the hands-on training that they will need? Well, of course you're going to give them that practical training. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, uh, powered industrial trucks are completely different than equipment most people have operated. So what you want to do is you have to show them how to operate the, the PIT. You're going to do that in an area that is away from everybody else. You know, block off an area because you don't want to be doing it in an aisle uh, with shelving units, that type of thing. And then gradually build up their skill level. Uh, start them out just running the lift on the, you know, the ground and then have them pick up a load. And if they're gonna put it on a shelf or a, a stack of pallets, then teach them how to do that. So, you know, in the beginning, a lot of times you'll, even after they uh, go out on the floor, you are going to add additional duties to them, but of course then they need additional training. So start them out just really simple and uh, you'll figure it out once they start to run that lift, you'll be able to, you know, figure out who's, really good at it and some are going to be better than others. Okay. Um, Cindy, next question for you from Laura and she's hoping you can uh, 
clarify some confusion that she has. And she asks, okay. if OSHA doesn't require documentation, are the inspection check records only for us to keep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and that's a good I that's a good question, a good clarification there. So yeah, they don't require inspection checklists or formal documentation. So really keeping those on file for however long you choose to is really going to be up to you. And it's more for like I mentioned, you want to have it's good to have for a reference point for them for employees while they're doing their inspections, but it's more so you want to have something in case an auditor or OSHA compliance officer comes in you want to they're going to say, can you show me your inspections, you want to have something to produce for them. Um, I always like to share the way that we used to do this and we checked with my OSHA I'm in Michigan, so we checked with my OSHA and it was actually a formidable way to do that I had a dry erase board that was for the week and it was for each piece of equipment and we dry erased on the board if nothing was wrong with the forklift we were able to erase that but once we showed that there was something wrong with it we transferred the information to our checklist our paper checklist and then turned that into maintenance because we had to take the forklift out of service so that was just a way also to show them you can show them the dry erase board like this is how we use it explain the process and a compliance officer would be okay with that but yeah laura that's mostly for your purposes they don't require anything to be documented great question okay thanks for the clarification yeah um mark you talked a little bit about modifications and killian wants to know if you rent the forklift, is the rental company responsible for notifying OSHA on modifications made to the forklift? Yes. So let's say you rent the forklift and you want a barrel clamp on it. They would have to get that prior written approval from the manufacturer. That's not your responsibility. It wouldn't hurt to just mention that, but they know if they're renting forklifts, they know that if they want to put a different you know, whatever on it that could affect capacity, they need to get that from the manufacturer. So just talk with them about that. Okay. Um, Cindy, a question from Samuel. Is there any required PPE to operate a forklift? So it's going to depend on the workplace related conditions that we talked about really for the PPE. Um, and, you know, OSHA does have specifics for like, uh, like, safety boots, sorry, I'm drawing a blank, safety shoes, safety boots for anything that rolls or could go over somebody's shoes. So typically our, your steel-toed or safety shoes would be required on that. Uh, long pants are technically something that should be worn on these as well. Um, not saying that that's what OSHA requires on it, but again, it's going to be up to what your hazards are, um, what your employee or employer policy is. If you don't have overhead protection and there are, are opportunities for things to fall on a, an operator's head, then that would require the hard hat. So it's more going to be looking at the PPE regulations and determining compared to what your workplace hazards are versus what the PIT standard says. So when you go to 1910-178, they're not going to list out PPE you're going to need to go into the PPE standards to figure out what might apply based on your hazards or workplace conditions. Great. Good to know. Thank you. Um, Mark Ann asks, <clears throat> do state OSHA regulations override the OSHA federal standard if the state standard is more stringent for trainers? Yes, they do. Um, but a lot of, even if it's a state plan state, a lot of these states just adopt or refer to the federal Certain states like California, Washington, and Oregon, their regs are completely different. So if you're in one of those three states, even Michigan has some differences, uh, take a look at that state standard. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cindy, Jamal wants to know, what is meant by the term poor evaluation? So when you're doing the evaluation, now remember there are three times that you're going to do the evaluation. You need to do initial training when somebody's new. If there's a refresher training, you want to do an evaluation of whatever applies to the refresher training, whether process changed or there was a near miss or something like that. And then there's going to be the every three year evaluation. Okay, so a poor evaluation is going to be you're observing this person, um, they are having difficulty maneuvering either we've talked about ramps a lot. So they're having difficulty um, maneuvering a ramp or they're going the wrong way with the forks or they're not a, they're not utilizing the attachments properly that may result in a negative evaluation um, in which case you would want to probably to start the training over I don't like to just dis, just um, oh what do I say I don't want to to give up on an employee any quicker than you have to so if it were me I would probably take this person back in sit down have a discussion go over difficult um 
processes or, or operations that they're having difficulty with, and then help them go through another evaluation. Maybe there's nothing that that OSHA says against doing a, a reevaluation on somebody, um, but give them some time to practice the things that you've gone over to help improve that poor performance. But really, a poor evaluation is going to be how they're operating the equipment. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Mark, Doug wants to know, he mentioned you talked about in-person training. Uh, what about online training? And are there any differences or other requirements for online training? You can, that's a good question. You can use the online training portion in the classroom, but you can't just put somebody, even for refresher or the three year, you can't just put somebody in front of a computer and have them take training and then consider that as uh, effective. There has to be classroom, practical training, and then the evaluation. But again, online could be part of the uh, classroom. Okay, great. Cindy, a really interesting uh, question here from Steve, who says, um, what if a company has no certified operators, but has a couple of folks that have extensive experience on the pit? Can they be a trainer and then be certified by one of the individuals that they just certified? So really good question, Steve. And again, it all goes back to the knowledge, skills, and experience, right? So you mentioned that they had the experience. It's also going to be if there are completely different types of pits, right? So if they're, if they have a completely, I'm not saying similar or different manufacturer, similar machine, I'm talking completely different types of pits. They need to have experience in each of those that are going to be operated in order to be considered quote certified, right? To teach. Now, if they are certified, Keep in mind, even your certified um, or your trainers, if they're in-house that are certified with their experience and stuff, they also have to be evaluated every three years, right? So yes, that would be a, a perfect scenario to have certified. And, and I'm using these air quotes because um, again, there's no standard written certification for this teaching. Um, but if they're going to train others, then they wanna have that knowledge experience in all the equipment that they're going to be training on, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's Great. a good use of other trainers. Great. Um, Mark, kind of following along those same lines, Martin asks, uh, should your training be specific to a specific make and model, for example, like different forklift manufacturers? So if let's say you're running a bunch of uh, sit down forklifts, the controls are going to be different, you know, in different areas, possibly, and they might operate uh, differently. So that's the kind of training that you need to do. It's not based on weight or, you know, lifts more than 5,000 pounds, lifts more than 10. It's based on the type. Okay. So if you have a sit down operator, you want them to run a stand up, you know, different training is going to have to take place. They understand the basics, but you have to train on the different equipment. So I hope I answered that question between manufacturers, the, the training would be pretty minimal. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Cindy Christopher asks, um, do you need to document your practical training component? So again, I would advise it. So they say that training needs to be documented. OSHA says that it needs to be documented in the fact that you need to um, put a the date that the training took place. Okay. Now, when they say training, remember that is all three components. Okay. So you'll want to have documentation that says when the training occurred, what information was covered in the training. And you could put the practical information along with that. So what's covered in classroom, covered in practical, however you want to document that. Um, it does need to be um, documented that you've covered what you need to cover. Um, you don't need every employee's signature. A lot of people think you do that, but OSHA doesn't require for training to have each employee's signature. Identifiers that say which employees were included should be on that documentation, but really you need the date, the trainer's name, signature, um, what was covered, so you can ensure that you've, um, you're in compliance with what's the topics that are required to be covered. So I would say the practical should fall in there as well, just to, to note that that's been done. Um, and include whatever paperwork you use for the practical right along with the documentation would be perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, Mark, next question for you from Tracy, um, who says, our manufacturer refers to us as an approved vendor for pretty much everything. We work with the approved vendor on ordering a personnel lift. So do we need an engineer from our vendor to write the letter of approval to use that personnel lift? I would save the documentation saying from the manufacturer that, hey, we recommend you go to XYZ company because all that is approved for your lift. So if you have that uh, and then you save 
the invoice for each piece of uh, equipment that you buy, each attachment or modification, and marry those two together. Since the manufacturer said go to this person, they've already given you permission to use their attachments. Okay, excellent. And it looks like we have time for one more question today. And Cindy, for you, a question from Anthony, who asks, what are some good hands-on tools to use within a classroom setting to help those who prefer kind of more visual or hands-on training? I like the equipment. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I really like to have the equipment that's going to be used, which is like why Mark mentioned, if you have a third-party trainer, have them come in and be familiar with your equipment before they um, are going to offer the training to your employees. And I like to do a top to bottom or a, a bottom up or a front to back sort of a, a training. Um, it doesn't feel as hands-on, but sure, the employees can get up in the seat. They can see where the controls are without before they have to operate those. Things like that can always be used. As far as in the classroom portion, again, it'd be more like it's hard to do that part in the classroom, doing yeah. a hands-on portion like that. If you have PPE, that's a requirement with your company while you're using the forklift definitely bring the PPE into the classroom. You can have the OSHA regulation up as just a visual so they can see just how much is entailed with keeping them safe, things like that. But yeah, I would use the equipment itself, especially as my um, hands-on component. Okay, excellent. Well, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time today. We're sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all the unanswered questions today will be forwarded along to our speakers. We thank you all for attending today's presentation. We appreciate you taking some time to share your feedback via our survey. A special thank you goes out today to our terrific presenters, Mark Stromey and Cindy Pauley, and everyone from the team over at JJ Keller. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.